this week's motoring news show, we look inside a Formula One engine, see racing the way it was back then, get a closer look at new ideas from Toyota, and Honda's view of the future. All this and more in this week's Drive. The performance of a Formula One car is spectacular. From naught to 100 in 2.5 seconds and with a top speed of over 350 kilometers an hour. The engines in these cars have changed dramatically over the years, but drivers had the most acceleration during the turbo era of the 1980s, at the risk of spectacular engine blow-ups. In 1987, Williams won the championship. Nelson Piquet had the fastest car with the most powerful engine, which survived the most races. In this model, the top output was about 1,200 horsepower from a 1.5-litre turbo engine. It was definitely time to make a break because that was a little bit too much. So this model appeared in 88 with a 3.5-litre aspirated engine and it only had 650 horsepower. Since then, the output of engines has been increasing steadily. The BMW engine in the current Williams FW25 puts around 900 horsepower onto the track from a capacity of 3 litres. And this is how 900 horsepower in a V10 Formula 1 engine sounds. 5,000 individual parts working in a harmonious symphony. The cylinder banks are built at an angle of 90 degrees, which gives the best compromise of cylinder size, weight and power. Renault has been trying out 110 degrees this year, but will go back to 90 degrees next year. The crankshaft spins at up to 19,000 times per minute, and the camshafts make 9,500 revolutions per minute. Extremely light valves shoot up and down using air pressure. Normal valves with steel springs could never reach these speeds. Careful design for maximum power continues inside the cylinder itself. The pistons have only two rings. They're flat and light. Special materials make them so durable that they can endure 1,500 ignitions per second, but they're replaced after every race. Valve timing is controlled via gear wheels for absolute precision and resilience. The carefully shaped exhaust is handmade and withstands temperatures of up to 800 degrees during the race. With the power to weight ratio critical, a Formula One engine weighs less than 100 kilograms. As a driver, you just drive on out and the engine feels powerful enough. You notice the difference in comparison to the previous year's engine the first time you drive the car. But a driver can't really judge the engine very precisely. That's what the test stands are for. About 400 kilometers at race speed are simulated on the testing equipment on the 200 Formula One engines that leave the BMW factory every year. Much of the design process is done on computer. Each engine is made individually and molds are carefully put together. Then the engine block and major parts are cast with specially formulated aluminium alloys. These are light and strong enough to handle temperature changes and stresses imposed both from within and also from the car itself. Building the engine takes around 80 hours of concentrated work for a skilled craftsman, and the result doesn't last much longer than a single race. Passenger car engines, on the other hand, are supposed to last for at least 200,000 kilometers, and they make other demands. They have to be powerful, economical, and clean. In the field of engines in particular, a great deal has been done in recent years and decades. On the one hand, the service life of the engine has been increased dramatically, and on the other hand, the emissions and fuel consumption have been reduced considerably. This has been made possible by various projects, but in particular by the optimization of the combustion process. It's been optimized partly through improved ignition. In other words, the ignition time is set perfectly by the engine control system. The process has also been improved through better mixing during the injection procedure. The levels of precision required in road car engines require the latest in measurement technology because best performance requires perfect precision in the increasingly complicated machines. Most Formula One races cover around 300 kilometers. Over this distance, 8 million controlled explosions will take place in the engine behind the driver. 
Unlike the turbo era, when a handful of cars would survive the race, most of today's races will go the distance. Looking to the past and paying tribute to the days of open cockpit racing, the field for the Macau Grand Prix Golden Jubilee Cup got away with a Le Mans-style running start. The race was a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Macau Grand Prix, Asia's most famous city circuit, and a key part of the careers of many drivers, including current Formula One world champion Michael Schumacher. Englishman Simon Hadfield stormed into the lead at the start from second on the grid to lead Grand Prix anniversary trophy winner Frank Sittner. As Sittner looked for a gap down the inside, Hadfield defended his line, and it almost cost him the race. Sittner was not finished, though, and charged past Hadfield across the start-finish line to lead and opened up a slight advantage before Hadfield decisively dived past on the third lap. From then on, with Sintner suffering an engine pickup problem, Hadfield was in control. Wrongly thinking he had a puncture, he tried to put out as much of an advantage as possible, just in case he had to pit for new rubber. And at the flag, he was 12.6 seconds in front. Dennis Welsh was third in his Lola 23B. The former Portuguese colony on China's southeastern coast marked the first of two racing weekends with a series of events like this, for roadsters not seen on its circuits since the late 1960s. There was heartbreak for Macau driver Chong Chi Loi in the Hotel Fortune Cup. Chong and his Honda were set to win when he spun out on a wet track with a finish line in sight. That allowed another local driver, Eriko de Jesus, through to win by six seconds, while a third Macau driver, Ho Kai Chung, took third, 27 seconds behind. Classic racing minis also got their chance on the circuit. Hong Kong drivers swept the board, Albert Poon winning with Fung Kwok Shing 20 seconds behind, while Chung Kwok Leung was third, 24 seconds off the pace. Racing gets serious next weekend at the Macau Grand Prix, with the highlights being the Motorcycle Grand Prix and Macau's signature Formula 3 championship. More than 110,000 race fans filled the stands for race 34 of the 36 race series in Phoenix. It was one of the races where cars weren't required to use performance-limiting restrictor plates in the intake system. At some tracks, NASCAR requires carburetor restrictor plates to keep the cars under 200 miles an hour. Early in the race, on the 33rd lap, Jeremy Mayfield's engine let go. He qualified 16th on the 43-car grid. After his retirement, the yellow flag stayed out for 10 laps, and at the green, Kurt Busch led after taking just two tyres during his pit stop. Later, veteran racer Ricky Craven spun on lap 140 and hit the outside wall. No one else was involved, and at the green, five laps later, Busch still led. Jimmy Spencer blew up his engine on lap 167 and slid offline, collecting Ward Burton and Kevin LePage on the way. Yeah. Spencer hit the wall hard, but as he walked back to the ambulance, he waved to the crowd, showing that he was OK. Several drivers pitted, and Ryan Newman grabbed the lead. Sixty laps after that incident, Rusty Wallace in car number two lost grip and tapped Tony Stewart. That led to a chain reaction pile-up that also involved Kevin Harvick, Bobby Labonte and Scott Wimmer. Incredibly, they all finished the race, Wimmer coming ninth. Dale Earnhardt Jr. passed Jimmy Johnson for the lead with 51 laps remaining in a race hit by a record tying 10 caution flags. The final restart came nine laps from the end of the 312-lap race and the one-mile oval, and Earnhardt won by three-quarters of a second, about five car lengths. It was his second win of the season and the ninth of his career. Five of the nine have come at the fast Daytona and Talladega circuits, where restrictor plates are used. In last week's drive, we looked at some of the styling and technology concept cars from the recent Tokyo Motor Show, and we felt that some of them deserved a second look. Perhaps one of the most significant was Toyota's revised Fine N. It points the way forward to fuel cell powered vehicles, and the name stands for Fuel Cell Innovative Emotion Next Generation. The car has all wheel drive thanks to an electric motor on each wheel. Each is individually and continuously controlled for acceleration and braking. The four in wheel motors are driven by Toyota's hydrogen fuel cell and lithium ion battery technology. 
giving the Fine N a cruising distance of over 300 miles. And if that's not high-tech enough, Fine N also uses a biometric face recognition system that identifies the driver for enhanced security and then automatically personalizes seat, pedal and steering wheel position, the audio system, climate controls and other settings. Besides the elimination of pollution, there's another great bonus in fuel cell vehicles. Without the space required by a typical engine and transmission, interior space is freed up and exterior design can be more innovative. The Fine N is about the size of a Toyota Corolla, but has the interior space of a Lexus. This is achieved thanks to low-profile hydrogen tanks, a thin fuel cell and power controller, and by having the electric motors at each wheel. In addition, all the car's systems, from steering to braking, is by wire, so there are no mechanical controls to take up space. With each wheel having its own drive motor, handling can be improved because power and situation-appropriate braking are more easily controlled. Toyota also showed an open-top roadster concept powered by hybrid petrol-electric technology, the main parts of which are mounted amidships, that is, ahead of the rear axle line, for improved handling and road holding. This next-generation system combines a 1.5-litre petrol engine with a 50-kilowatt high-output electric motor for powerful acceleration, much like the existing Prius, which is already selling in small numbers around the world. The interior uses a horseshoe theme to define individual spaces for the driver and passenger. The seats fold forward to cover the dash and protect it from the elements, with the rest of the cockpit made from weather-resistant materials, making a roof unnecessary, so long as you don't get caught out by the weather. The car also converts from a two to a four-seater, space for rear passengers hiding beneath a canopy, but it looks pretty tight. Taking the high-tech theme on, the navigation, audio and climate control functions are accessed by a space touch screen that uses a small camera to monitor hand position. But with the classic body design, simple mechanical controls might have been better. Judging by the lack of any evidence to the contrary, it would seem that this concept is strictly about styling and the technology doesn't actually work yet. No matter, it's a brave statement about the future. Sport utility vehicles, or SUVs, are regularly under fire for their size and fuel inefficiency. But Toyota aims to change that image with a technology found in the SU HV1. Based on the mid-sized Toyota Harrier, or Lexus RX330, the SU HV1 previews a production-ready hybrid that will probably be introduced into some markets during 2004. This time, the hybrid system uses the regular 3.3-litre V6 petrol engine, but adds a 120-kilowatt electric motor. By raising the electrical system's voltage and using a faster spinning motor and generator, Toyota has achieved higher electrical output and a motor with the torque to match the V6 engine. To create an electrical-assisted four-wheel drive system, Toyota added another 50-kilowatt motor in the rear of the vehicle, which also offers higher output and torque as a benefit of the more powerful electrical system. This so-called hybrid synergy drive gives the SU HV1 the performance of a V8 with a fuel efficiency and emissions of a compact car, twice as good as those of an SUV of equal displacement. An additional advanced vehicle dynamics management design is the concept for a next-generation vehicle movement control that coordinates the hybrid system, electric four-wheel drive and electronically controlled brake system for improved handling and road holding stability. Whether those eye-catching indicators make it into production remains to be seen. Toyota describes the PM, for personal mobility, as a vehicle you can wear appropriate since its silvery exterior colour changes like a giant mood ring. Looking like a cross between a motorcycle, a wheeled casket and some kind of alien life form, the PM is destined to be primarily a headline grabber and a crowd generator. PM can shift between an entry-exit mode, where the PM moves the cabin to an almost upright position to make getting in and out easier, a low-speed city mode, where the wheelbase is partially shortened and driving position is elevated, or a car-like high-speed mode, with the wheelbase fully extended for greater stability. To get in and out, the single front door opens up wide, a bit like the old-fashioned Isetta and Messerschmitt three-wheeled bubble cars of the 1950s. The PM's power comes from an electric motor mounted around the back and driving the rear wheels. 
It also boasts a very tight turning radius as the wheels can pivot in or out to a much higher degree than a normal car. Inside, a floating space touch holographic display senses the driver's finger position, allowing touchless control of vehicle data and functions. The PM is designed to communicate with other PM vehicles and can travel in close groups or have the drivers chat when parked. Steering is done by two joysticks positioned on either side of the driver and uses drive-by-wire technology. In fact, the PM points drive-by-wire to its logical, or perhaps its illogical, conclusion. It will probably only be a matter of time before a production car incorporates a joystick as part of the standard driver's controls. Clever as the PM is, it's not likely to be in showrooms anytime soon. Can you imagine what the crash test engineers would make of it? In Tokyo, Honda showed both concepts and showroom-ready vehicles. In the case of the Odyssey People Mover or minivan, they showed both. This all-new Odyssey will be heading towards showrooms in coming months. The new family bus has an innovative low-floor platform that provides a lower center of gravity for improved handling and a low roof line with obvious access, handling and aerodynamic advantages. The new Odyssey gets Honda's latest 3.5-litre 24-valve variable valve timing V6 engine that delivers 240 horsepower while also meeting stringent low-emission vehicle standards. This engine requires no major tune-ups for the first 160,000 kilometres, and a 5-speed automatic transmission puts the power to the road. Inside, there's a DVD system and satellite navigation. The Absolute is the top draw high-end model intended for the domestic market initially, but it might end up in other major markets, particularly Asia and Europe. The model uses a standard 2.4-litre twin-cam engine and either a regular 5-speed automatic gearbox or a newly developed CVT plus 7-speed mode transmission, which is either a stepless constant velocity transmission or a selectable 7-speeder. The new low-floor platform ensures a roofline of just 1,550 millimetres, low enough to fit into standard multi-level parking facilities, which is a uniquely Japanese problem stemming from buildings constructed when Japanese car factories produced tiny cars for the home market. Sharing the Tokyo show stage with the new Odyssey showroom models was the ASM concept vehicle, an eight-seater minivan offering both advanced technology and luxury accommodation. Much closer to a production vehicle than Honda's other concepts, the ASM is expected to be a preview of the next generation Honda minivan. The V6 engine has variable cylinder management to improve fuel efficiency while cruising. This delivers both high output and clean performance with a smooth, quiet ride. The wood panelled interior is inspired by the sophisticated atmosphere of the lounge on an ocean cruiser. Ambient LED lighting creates a relaxed mood, and a sliding 10-inch monitor for second and third row passengers makes the inside of the ASM a comfortable place to spend some time. ASM is also a hybrid. It uses a refined version of the petrol-electric system used in the Insight and Civic Hybrid. Another serious concept and a likely candidate as the next generation NSX, the two-seater HSC, or Honda Sports Concept, uses a 300-plus horsepower mid-engine V6 with a Formula One-style paddle shifter dual-mode transmission. Typically, Honda is being very tight-lipped about the HSC and its production potential, and media reports suggest that we shouldn't expect to see the HSC in showrooms before late 2007. The HSC was designed so that anyone can handle a sports car. Shorter, wider and lower than the current NSX and with a more than passing resemblance to Ferrari's Enzo, the HSC offers high performance and handling in an easy to drive vehicle, like the current NSX, dubbed the everyday supercar since its launch a decade ago. There are suggestions that this might be Japan's first real threat to the acknowledged high performance car builders of Europe. If that's true, it will need a lot more than 300 horsepower on tap. The new chassis, with its long wheelbase, wide track and short overhangs, looks capable of handling much more. As hard as it may seem to believe, Honda promises the high-tech combination of a lightweight body, wind-cheating aerodynamics and a refined version of the petrol-electric hybrid engine 
will push the IMAS concept car to achieve more than 30 kilometers on each liter of fuel. Constructed of lightweight carbon fiber and aluminum, its overall weight is just 700 kilograms and its drag coefficient is a slippery 0 0.20, making it a highly efficient little sports car. Handling is helped by a shaftless variable gear ratio steering system with drive-by-wire technology, which also offers a natural linear throttle response. Designed for lightness, the interior construction is sparse and reveals the aluminium frame structure, reminiscent of a racing bicycle with its shining parts shown to advantage. An ultra-thin transparent instrument panel and navigation monitor provide comprehensive information, including images from a closed-circuit digital camera showing what's happening to the sides and rear of the vehicle. The brief for the IMAS was to combine fun-to-drive sports car performance with an advanced, lightweight, aerodynamic and environmentally friendly package, all of which seems to have been achieved. Designed to suggest where the teardrop-shaped inside two-seater could evolve, IMAS is quicker than the original. Hopefully, the technology will also become cheaper with practice, as the high purchase price of Insights has limited sales. Honda was the world's first car maker to put a fuel cell vehicle into dealers' showrooms, and the Kiwami concept matches Honda's clean performing fuel cell technology with the Japanese aesthetic of cleanliness to create a sedan for the next generation. Advanced packaging technology has made possible a lower floor that ensures a roomy interior despite the vehicle's low roofline. The car is just 1.25 meters high. While the outside surfaces are boxed and flat, the interior designs try to be relaxing with only a few smooth accents. Each seat is at least three feet away from each other, ensuring that no two passengers will ever touch each other. The interior design is based on the kind of feeling a Japanese experiences when contemplating a carefully tended garden or watching the interplay of light and shadow on a paper screen. The fuel cell system combines a next-generation DC motor and a hydrogen storage system for improved response and energy efficiency. An H-shaped layout for the control unit, ultracapacitor, fuel cell stack, hydrogen storage unit and other components creates a low center of gravity, lower overall vehicle height and a spacious interior, along with synchronized control four-wheel drive handling performance. Finally, a distinctly un-high-tech bit of motoring action from rural Thailand, where small two-wheel diesel tractors are known as iron buffaloes. It's easy to see why. The fun starts when the operators of these hard-working machines get together and play on their days off. They do what any racing mad enthusiast does. They go drag racing. How much diesel smoke and particulates must each farmer inhale over his working life, starting these things each morning? On the first weekend each month, farmers from across four provinces descend on a small drag strip about 50 kilometers northwest of Bangkok. Racing down a straight 200-meter track at up to 65 kilometers an hour, the men compete for a 5,000 baht top prize, about $125 or roughly two months' wage. The Kwai Lek, or Iron Buffalo, tractor was first used in Thailand in the 1960s, introduced by a member of the royal family well known for agricultural inventions and tractor racing is becoming increasingly popular, so much so that it's regularly televised on national channels. And with an eye on the past, the present, and maybe the future, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.